So today we're going to talk more systematically about stress. Uh, in the first lecture, we sort of used stress colloquially to talk about, you know, the, the forces in the earth that arise due to tectonic motion, of course. Now, you've all had, also had injury mechanics, right? So you were introduced to stress, and you're probably introduced to it sort of like this, right? That stress is the force divided by an area, okay? And that if you look at that equation, it sort of implies that stress is a scalar, right? Force is like a number divided by a number is just a number, okay? But we... We also know force is really a vector. If you remember in your statics class, that's all you did was a bunch of vector addition and subtraction and, and manipulation. So force is clearly a vector, right? So area is clearly a scalar. So if you have a force divided by, you know, a vector divided by a scalar, you still have a vector, right? So stress is not a scalar. It's at least a vector, right? It just, in this case, it's still a vector, it's just all of the components but one are zero, so you can sort of describe it as a, a single number, a scalar, right? So, so you have some area, and you have some force on it, force, okay, some area. So stress is force divided by, or normalized by some area. And it turns out if you take like graduate courses in continuum mechanics, you can, you, you can realize that you can actually describe stress in terms of many different areas because, right, you have a body that's undeformed and then you squeeze it and it's deformed, well, which area do you choose? You could choose to normalize it by the undeformed area or you could choose to normalize it by the area that is after you deformed it, okay? Uh, and so we're, we're not going to do that. We're going to assume that the deformations are small enough that there's just sort of one area, and it's sort of the reference <coughs> configuration, okay? And, but, but nevertheless, uh, also, you know, so the force divided by the area, and it's also a point-wise quantity. Stress is a point-wise quantity. So what I mean by that is that, you know, mathematically a point is like, something has zero volume. Right? And clearly this bar, as I have it drawn, has a volume. So we would fill it with a whole bunch of points, in, in fact, an infinite number of them. Right? So if I could draw these small enough and fill up the whole volume with those points, each of those points would have its own stress. Okay? Now it turns out that because this is a uniform cross-section and I'm applying the force uniformly, while each of them would have their own stress, they would all be identical to each other in this case, okay, as I have it drawn. Okay, but I guess what I want to say here is that let's imagine that instead of the way I have it drawn there, the area I want to draw there, I want to take the same force and I want to know I want to normalize it by this area, like an area that's a cross section of the bar at an angle. Right? So I've cut the bar in half, and instead of cutting it on a plane perpendicular, I cut it at an angle. And so now this area is different than that area. Everybody agree with that? Right? So the, the initial area was a circle, and then now this is like an ellipse because I've cut it across the, at, at an angle. So the force is, is identical. The force is the same, but now I want to normalize it by a different area, so clearly if I just use this equation, I'm going to get a different value. Right? But I told you this, this bar is uniform. I'm pulling on it with the same force. The stress should be the same everywhere. So there's sort of a paradox here. Because I just have one equation, one force, two areas, I get two different answers, but we know the stress is the same. And so what it is is that the stress is, first of all, not a scalar. It's a tensor. 
We'll talk about what a tensor is in a second. Okay. But it's also dependent upon the coordinate system that we choose. Right. So here, it's like I embedded a coordinate system, say, in this plane. And over here, I embedded a coordinate system in the plane of the cut. And through, it turns out that through, if I, if I know the stress here, I can use a transformation. And we talked, we in the linear algebra, we talked, at least showed equations for how a matrix transforms, right? And it turns out, for the purposes of this class, the stress tensor will also be a matrix. That's not always true, okay? Not all tensors are matrices. But again, for the purposes of this class, the stress tensor you, we can treat mathematically like a three by three ma matrix. So we can transform it like a matrix. So in other words, if I knew the full stress, you know, in either case, here or here, I can use a matrix transformation <laughs> via the basically essentially the transformation of this coordinate system to that one through the angles. Really, you can see that's just sort of a rotation of coordinate systems, right? So if I just rotate this coordinate system into that one, then I can transform the stress appropriately. And so therefore, we can see that they sort of mathematically all represent the same thing. It's just via a coordinate transformation, or it's dependent upon the coordinates that you choose. Okay. So So let's look at a piece of the crust of the Earth. I'm going to I'm going to cut out a little piece of the crust. Okay. Now we know from what we talked about last time that there's stresses on this thing because the crust is moving around slowly, and it could be due to uh, you know, depending upon exactly which piece of the Earth we, we cut out, it could be near a, a, a divergent plate boundary where the magma is coming up and pushing this plate across uh, away. You know, it could be in a subduction region where one plate is moving under the other. All of those for cause forces on the crust, squeeze it, right? And so let's draw some arbitrary forces on the crust, right? So there's this thing is being squeezed in some way. Turns out my drawing's not real, really realistic because almost all of the crust is in compression. Right? So uh, these arrows imply that it might be in tension, but it doesn't really matter. So I guess just to be. Okay. So I have this piece of crust, and those forces that act on the, on the outside, we're going to call those tractions, right? So these are, these are tractions, and what tractions really are are sort of stress vectors, right? So they have units of force per unit area, okay? But they also have a direction. So they, we call these tractions. It's like a stress vector. It's a force per area. <coughs> All right. And then, of course, if we were to look at, say, any little infinitesimal cube inside this guy, so any little infinitesimal cube inside that guy, there's also going to be a body force acting on it. What's, what's the body force? There's at least one. There could be more, but there's at least one body force acting on all of us. Gravity, right? <coughs> right. That's a body force. So there could be there could be other body forces. Uh, <coughs> electromagnetic forces are also body forces. 
But there's at least gravity, for sure, if we're talking about a piece of DNA. <clears throat> and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that little cube. Take it, and I'm going to pull it out over here, OK? And I'm going to redraw it. And in fact, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to redraw it on a, on a coordinate system. And I'm the modeler, so I can choose the coordinate system. So the, the coordinate system is going to be, I'm going to label it x1, x2, x3. And so now I'm going to draw my little cube on that coordinate system. Now, because my big piece of crust has external forces on it, and my little cube in the middle there is also going to have external forces on it, right? These same forces are going to be applied internally to my little cube as well as any body force. So let's draw those. Let's draw those. Uh, surface forces, they'll again be tractions. So let's see here. So I have a force on this face. I'm going to call it T. It's a vector. And I'm going to use a little superscript here uh, to say that this is in the E2 direction. And what E2 is, is a normal vector that defines the normal to this face. Okay, so this is E2. Right? And likewise, there's an E1 and an E3. So these are these are just unit vectors. You might you might be more used to seeing it like I, J, and K, right? Okay, so these are just normal vectors. That point in the in the in this case, because my cube is superimposed perfectly on my axis, they point in the same direction as my coordinate axes. They just have unit magnitude, okay? And they define the faces of the cube, okay? And the reason I drew them on there because I, I want to say that that this this vector here, this vector here, it's on the face defined by E2 but not in the direction of E2. You understand? So this, I mean, I clearly drew it that way, right? This, this guy is pointing in a different direction than that one. OK? But I use the superscript E2 to say that it's, it sort of emanates from the face that's defined by E2. Right? And likewise, we'd. have a T in the E3. Okay. Again, not in the E3 direction, but on the face E3. And a T in the E1. And my little cube is in equilibrium, right? It's not in motion. So if I had a cube and I pulled on three sides of it like that, and there was no counterbalancing force, the cube would fly through space, right? So my cube is in equilibrium, which means there's going to be equal and opposite forces on the back side of the cube, right? So the, the plot's going to get a little busy here, but you know, so like back here, there's a force that's equal and opposite to T E2. Down here, there's a force that's equal and opposite to T E3. And back here, there's a force that's equal and opposite to T E1. OK? So I'm going to do one last thing with this plot. 
And that is, I'm going to take my cube and I'm going to slice it on a diagonal. So I'm going to take this guy and I'm going to slice it like this, right along the diagonal. So if I take a cube and I slice it on the diagonal, what is left? Two geometric things, what are they called? They're sort of little pyramids, right? If I take a cube and I slice it along the diagonal, there you go, a tetrahedron. It was written there. Okay. And there it is. Okay. So <coughs> I cleaned it up. But all those vectors are exactly what I had this drawn for you. So we, we took this little cube out, and we labeled its faces, and then we just drew vectors on it, and this is what we have left, okay? Now, when you, in mechanics, when you don't know anything else, where should you start? If you don't know anything else and you're trying to solve the mechanics problems, where should you start? Well, we have that. That's what we just did. This is this is a free body diagram. Force balance, okay? Another another name for force balance is attributed to this guy Newton, right? Newton's Newton's second law, Newton's second law, right? Or maybe more technically conservation of linear momentum, right? Okay. So Whenever you don't know anything else in mechanics, write down F equals MA and see what happens. Okay. So that's what we're going to do. So this is our free body diagram. It's probably a little more complicated seemingly. Right? But, and, and as we move forward, just keep in mind, all we're going to do is use geometry and F equals MA. All right? So, oh, I guess. There is one thing to point out in that. In this, uh, you know, when we sliced it, and when we sliced it, we summed those forces on, on the other side of this tetrahedron, and we now have a, a force on this that's normal to this face, and we're just going to call it Tn. Okay. So that's that's this red vector that's emanating from the from the front face that we sliced here, and it it is. Uh, labeled via or, or um, defined via the normal vector n. That's a normal vector to the face of that tetrahedron right there. Okay, so n um, let's see so n is a unit vector that has components N1, N2, N3, and what they are, they're the cosine defined between N1 and the X1 axis, or so rather N and the X1 axis. N and the X1 axis, cosine over n with the x2 axis and the cosine over n with the x3 axis. So I don't, I don't actually know what the angle is, right? But there, there's, you know, there's some angle, there's some angle between n and the x2 axis, between n and the x1 axis. So I, that's why I wrote it like that. But I don't know exactly what the angle is. And sort of one more pre preliminary thing. You know, if we have, if you know, like, um, let me see. 
if you if you have a line L and it has some angle theta, right, between that, you know, some, that, some plane or some other line, there's an angle theta. Then the projection of this line L onto this line, right, is what? So the, you know what I'm saying, the projection, so like this part of the line is what? Well, it's, it's L cosine theta. So that same sort of rule holds if if I have a plane. Right? So if I take this line, if I take this line and I extend it into a plane in space, right? and then I want to project that down, I want to project that down onto another plane. where the projection would be like this. Right, and the the, um, the projected area would be down here. Everybody kind of see what I'm talking about in my drawing? I have a, you know, imagine I have a, plane here, make some angle with the table, and I want to know what the area is sitting right under, right? So if I, if I shine a light up here, I'd want to know what the shadow is underneath the table. <coughs> so it turns out that we can use the same rule, right? So just like this is L cosine theta, if I know the area of this plane, and I know that angle, so if the area up here is A in the area, then I want to know, what, say, what A prime is, which is this the red area underneath, right? So I should probably use the right colors here. Right, so this is A, and this is A prime, then A prime is A cosine Right. So the same thing. Okay. So let's use the labels then. Let's we, let's use our free body diagram. So this is our free body diagram, and we're going to write F equals ma right here. Right. So these are tractions. Right. These little vectors are tractions. Force per unit area. So in order to write F equals MA, force, I have to multiply by the area, right? So I have a force per unit area, I need to multiply by the area. Well, the area is DA of this face, and DA2, DA1, DA3, DA right? So they're all drawn on there. So I'm just going to write F equals M. So I have Tn times dA. Right? So that's this guy. That vector times this area. Minus, because you know this this is my positive coordinate systems are coming this way. So this is clearly going to be a have all positive components the way it's drawn. But all of these guys have negative components, right? The blue ones, they're in a negative direction. So minus T, T1. And I want to write it in terms of, so I have DA1. But using our rule here, DA1 is in. Right, it, it, it's the cosine of the angle. It's it's dA times the cosine of the angle between them, and the angle between them is the is the unit vector component, right? As as we defined it up there. So so then what I'm going to have is n1 
dA. And likewise for the other components. So T, these are, these are vectors. T, E2, N2, dA, minus T, E3, <coughs> N3, dA. Right, so that's the sum of the forces. Right, that's, that's all forces. F equals MA. All right. So what's the mass of this thing? Well, the mass of anything is its density times its volume. All right. So I don't know if density is labeled on there, but we'll just use rho for density times the volume. Well, what's the volume of a tetrahedron? What's the volume of a pyramid? One third the area of, of the base yeah. times its height. Okay. So that's why this little h is labeled here. So the h is the distance between the centroid of this face and the origin. Or it's the height. You know, If I take that down and turn it over, I have a pyramid. h is the height. Right. So I'm going to have one third h times the area of the base, which is dA. Right, so that's mass. Density times volume is mass. So that's M. And then A is just A. <laughs> Newton's second law. Well, one thing we notice right away that all, there's a dA in every term, and so they can cancel, right? DA in every term. All right, so the other thing is, you remember, uh, it was sort of the reason I wanted to make the point, that stress is a point-wise quantity, right? A point, mathematically, has zero volume. So what we really want to do, if we're sort of trying to figure out what a stress is, what the stress is, is we want to take the limit of this as, as it goes to zero volume, right? Or the limit is H goes to zero. So if I shrink H, I shrink this tetrahedron to a point. So we're going to say, we're going to take the limit as H goes to zero, which you can clearly see makes this term go to zero, the whole thing. So this, then the whole term goes to zero. Right. So what I have left is just over here. That is equal to zero. Okay. So I'm going to make a blank page and I'm going to rewrite this equation. Okay. Keep in mind <coughs> right, that these are vectors. Okay. So they have a little. I try to be explicit. They have a little vector mark on the top. So these are vectors. So while it just really looks like one equation, these of course have three components each. Right. So each, each t vector is made up of t1, t2, t3. Right. And so on the next page, I'm going to write out all the co components. And really, really what this is, when you have, when you have a vector equation like that, you probably, remember, if you've had linear algebra, you certainly have seen it. But even in your other classes, you can see that you know, any times you have a system of equations, we can write them in a more compact form in like terms of vectors or sometimes matrices. Okay, so that's sort of what what we have here is a system of equations because each of these guys has three components, so we have three equations. All right, and so I'm going to write those three equations out on the next page. So <coughs> what those three equations are are T1N, 
e1, e1, n1, plus t2, no t1, that's still t1. So those are the three equations. And now we're just going to write them in matrix form. Right? So this, in matrix form, is going to be T1 Everybody okay with that? Right. So that these three equations written in the matrix vector form are just like this. You know, you can see using your matrix vector row operations like we talked about. And if I just multiply this vector times the first row, I get the first equation. Right. And then multiply this vector times the second row, and I get that second equation. And so forth. Right. So this thing right here is the stress. It's a tensor. Okay. Now, again, we're not going to really talk about what the differences are in this class, but really what makes a tensor a tensor is in the way that they transform via coordinate transformation. That's really all you need to know. Okay. So you can have uh, basically, a vector is a first order, is also a tensor. A vector is a first order tensor. What we have here is a second order tensor. And where they really, in, in, in terms of vectors and second order tensors, they're just, I mean, first order tensors and second order tensors are really just analogous to vectors and matrices, okay? It's when you go higher, when you go third, third order, fourth order, whatever, that's when you really see the differences, okay? But we're not going to do anything higher than the second order tensor in this class. So from now on going forward, we're just going to treat it like it's a matrix, a three by three matrix. Okay. Now, we often use, if you remember, right, what is the what is the superscript, the E1, E2, E3, what did that, what did that represent on our original drawing? I made a big deal about showing you the difference between the vector and the and the unit vector. 
the face that the vector was coming from, right? So up here, we the superscript, uh, the superscript is the face that the vector is coming from. Okay. The the subscript is the component. Okay. The the comp you know the direction. All right. So <coughs> it turns out it's not really uh, it's not really that important. But I, I said this is the stress. This is actually the stress transpose. Don't don't worry about it too much. I'll fix it right here. Technically, this is the stress transpose. And the reason is, uh, by convention, we're gonna we're gonna instead of having subscripts and superscripts to de describe everything, we're gonna we're gonna use a new convention. Okay. And that new convention, where now this is the real stress, has the components S11. S12, S13, S21, S22. Right. So if you really want to see what those are equal to, then it's like T1, 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 T2, T1, T1, T2, T2. T2. And so the con th this would help if you can remember what you know. I made a big deal that the superscript defined the face at which the vector emanated from, and then the subscript there was the component, right? The, co the, the, the component of the vector. Okay. So if you can remember that there, and then you see this equivalence, then you can figure out what the shorthand here is. And the, the shorthand convention here is that the first number in the entry, what? Oh, you had, I thought you had your hand up. The first number in the, in the entry is the face, okay? The first number is the face. And the second number is the component. Okay? So there's our, our stress tensor. Uh, I guess it's probably you know in, in the mechanics literature and almost every other field except geomechanics, it's it's typically the sigma is the conventional. I mean probably that's what you learned in engineering mechanics. You always use sigma for stress. In this class, you'll see S. Okay, it'll be from pretty much from here going forward, it'll be S. Okay, uh, so S is the is more common in, in geomechanics. Um, and there's our you know, visual definition. Again, if you look at if you look at any face, then you have the three components, you'll notice that again, it's the same as the convention that I just defined. This is the E2 face. So the first number is two in all those cases. That defines the face. The first number defines the face. The second, the direction, right? So, so the, the one direction is that way. The two direction is that way. The three direction is that way. And I, again, I have it in, in words here. 
So that is stress, mathematically. All right. Now, thankfully, uh, there's a couple things. There's a couple things. We're not going to go through it all, but what we wrote down was essentially, to get to this, we wrote down conservation of linear momentum. Right? It turns out that we can use conservation of angular momentum to show that the stress, or at least this stress, which again technically is something called the Kochi stress, named after the guy Kochi right? uh, that came up with it, the Kochi stress is symmetric. Right? It has it, the conservation of angular momentum leads to this conclusion. Okay, so the Kochi stress is symmetric. So now you've noticed that I've replaced. Uh, well, no, I didn't. I didn't do it here, but but I can replace, and, and we may. You may see that going forward, but the only unique entries are above the diagonal uh, because S21 is equal to S12, S31 is equal to S13, and S32 is equal to S23. All right, so that's one thing that, that makes it easy is that uh, easier. We went from nine entries down to six unique entries because of the symmetry. It just says what I wrote. And so yeah, there's the there's the more collapsed stress tensor where I have the correct off-diagonal entries. And so it turns out that we can use it. Remember, we, in the, high, in the um, sort of linear algebra lesson, we talked about matrix transformations. Okay? It turns out that if we have a, our tensor S, there is a particular matrix Q that will turn an S into a diagonal matrix. So a diagonal matrix is just one, it's all zeros and it has entries along the diagonal. Right? So we're going to call that S prime. And turns out that the, the particular matrix that does that is the matrix of eigenvectors. And we'll talk more next time about, you know, it, it, it turns out that this S prime, the entries along the diagonal are the eigenvalues. So if you remember, I sort of introduced the eigenvalue problem, but we didn't. I said we'll come back to it when we're going to talk about stress. And so this is what we're going to, what we'll do next time. We'll see that <coughs> if we solve the eigenvalue problem and come up with the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we'll see that the entries of S prime are the eigenvalues, and this particular matrix Q that can transform our stress tensor in this context into a diagonal stress tensor. Those are called the eigenvectors. And they have to do with, you know, essentially uh, what you'll see is what we'll call them in, in terms of this is principal stresses and principal direction. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, we'll f yes. Yeah. It, we'll, more details next time. But yeah, essentially, S prime is a diagonal matrix, and the values along the diagonal are the eigenvalues. Okay. And we'll we'll work an example next time. Okay.